So I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Philemon. Book of Philemon. We're going to be finishing Philemon today. And we're going to be just going through one of the just greatest books in all of Scripture. And it's one of the shortest books in all of Scripture. By this time, every single person in here who's been coming during this series, you should have read Philemon at least five, six times. And if you sat and did, if you read through Philemon five or six times in one sitting, it'd take you probably 20 minutes if you just really take your time and drink coffee in between every couple of verses as I drink some coffee. So if you guys are opening up the Philemon, please follow along. We're going to be looking at 17 to 25. 17 to 25. You guys ready? Here we go. So remember, these are the key players. Paul is writing a letter to Philemon and his church about the slave Onesimus. Say Onesimus. Onesimus, Onesimus is the slave's name. So this is who he's talking to. So Paul says, So if you, Philemon, consider me a partner, accept him, Onesimus, um, as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I'll repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self. Yes, brother, may I have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I hope that through your prayers, I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. This is where we start. Number one, the gospel transforms everything by changing me first. The gospel transforms everything by changing me first. One of the biggest mistakes that the average brand new believer makes is they think that they've ex- they confess Christ and they accept the Lord, and all of a sudden the world's going to all make sense. That's not true. The gospel starts with you. You confess your sins. You are the one who need to be worrying about yourself at that point. You, you don't have time to judge others because you are spending all your time trying to get your own stuff together. And that's how it starts. If, if, just if more Christians would spend more time worrying about themselves than pointing their finger at others, it would be a gr- better place. And Paul begins this with a very specific language. He uses business language. You see this word partner. This word partner. If you guys remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to write in it. This is a picture, of, a picture of the page in my Bible. The word participation shows up here in verse 6. That word participation and this word partner are the same Greek word. And if you want to start getting fancy and you want people to think that you read your Bible a lot, circle both those words and write a line because those are the exact same Greek words. And just so you know, in Greek, especially in the letters of Paul, we come to find that when he repeats a word, he's trying to emphasize that word. And this word for partnership is the word koinonia, koinonia. And it's also a business contract. So we see this with business partners. We see this in, in extra biblical texts. Uh, we see Seneca and others using this exact same word to talk about a business transaction or a business partner. Also, when it comes to marriage, we have extra biblical texts that talk about the marriage partner. But either way, the emphasis is a contractual agreement between equals. That's the point, between equals. These are people who understand they are equals. No one's above the other. That's a partnership. This is why Paul, he continues in this text, he says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. He wants the the reader, Philemon, to know he's writing this. And, And Paul is elderly at this point. So most of his letters are actually, he dictates and the person writes it. But in this case, he pushed whoever aside for a second and says, no, give me the pen, and he dips it in the, in the ink, and he goes, I'm writing this in my own hand. He wants him to know that I am the one writing this. Because he wants this letter to be a promissory note, or what we would call an IOU. He is saying, whatever debt Onesimus may owe, I will repay it. I will pay the penalty, charge it to my account. And this is setting the example. 
Because Paul is letting Philemon know that not only should he forgive Onesimus, but Paul is also willing to forgive Philemon. Because he says here, not to mention you owe me even your own self. He says, hey, I'm willing to forgive you what you owe me, and by extension, you should forgive Onesimus. And who do you think example Paul is following? This is the Sunday school question. Whose example is, is Paul following? Jesus. Jesus was the first one to forgive you your sins. Remember the, the perfect prayer that Jesus taught us, forgive your sins is just as God forgives yours? That's what Paul is doing. He's setting the example. And we see this here in Romans 15, 7. It says, therefore accept one another just as the Messiah also accepted you to the glory of God. So the example to set is Jesus, and it's, not, it's our responsibility to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, the text says, and to correct others secondarily. We have here Philippians. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but he says you've obeyed even when I'm not there. Now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say... Go to your neighbor's house and look in the window and point your finger. He says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. But here's the thing, why? Here we go, let's look at Jesus. Jesus gives us this great text here. Jesus says, do not judge, so you won't be judged. For with the judgment you use, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured against you. And this verse is important because the average person actually doesn't understand what Jesus is actually saying here. Just like uh, Tupac saying, only God can judge me. That's not what this text is actually saying. This text is not actually saying, only God can judge you. For example, he says, he continues, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? Paul is trying to, or sorry, Jesus is trying to point to the fact that we got our own stuff to deal with. You don't point out the speck in your brother's eye when you got your stuff to deal with. And he continues, he answers it. This is the answer. This is the reason why Jesus says this. He says, hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, but here's the point that a lot of people miss, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus was telling people how to judge correctly, not to not judge. That would be absurd. Could you imagine raising your children and never telling them right or wrong? It doesn't make any sense. You have to raise those kids to know, to grow, to understand running in the street is dangerous. You, that's, that is a judgment call. And G Jesus is telling us to, how to do it correctly. You do it correctly by not being a hypocrite when you do it. And he says this. This is the, the one, this is the verse that everybody seems to leave out. Jesus says this. Don't give what is holy to dogs and toss pearls before swine or they will trample you with their feet, turn and tear you to pieces. The point is, is correction. The context is hypocrisy, and this verse is not warning, is, it's not a warning to not judge ever, it's a warning if you are going to judge correctly, you need to not be a hypocrite when you do it. And that's the hard part. I've worked with a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics, I have my own drug issues growing up, and you got to be very careful because I've actually been around folks who are alcoholics who are pointing their finger at the person who's a meth addict and going, what an idiot. Wait a second. You're an addict too. Yeah, but I'm not a meth addict. Who cares? You're still an addict. Who do you, where do you get off pointing your finger? I've also seen people who are addicted to cocaine call people who are addicted to crack crackheads. Oh, I would never be a crackhead. It's, it's the same drug, just it's done differently. In one instance, you smoke it. The other one, you snort it and rub it around in your gums a little bit. Either way, you got a problem. And what is the point of sitting here and pointing your finger? And here's the thing. That doesn't mean you can't be helpful. If you are struggling with sin, awesome. You can encourage one another. And you might be a further ahead in your maturity in many other ways. But when it comes to your own sin, you have no right to point your finger when you know you're struggling with something and tell them, you know what, you got to lift yourself up by your bootstraps. I made this joke one time. I said it's like it's like throwing, it's like throwing a bunch of crayons to toddlers and have and expecting them to teach each other how to write in cursive. 
It doesn't work. That's not how the world works. You have to, perf you, a person who teaches you how to live right has to have that part of their life under control. Otherwise, you have no right to point your finger. And Paul definitely has his understanding of forgiveness and grace and mercy under control. He has every right to correct Philemon. Number two, the gospel is empty without others in my life. I have no idea how many times I've heard a well-meaning person who believes in God but doesn't believe in Jesus tell me, I don't need church. I can just meet God in the woods or meet God outside or whatever. That's just complete and utter nonsense. We see this throughout Scripture that you need others to grow in your faith. You can't be challenged by a tree. You need to be challenged by others. He says, yes, brother, may I have joy from you in the Lord. He says, refresh my heart in Christ. He's, I'm confident in your obedience. And they're not even in the same city. There's no Facebook. There's no texting. Paul is hearing about Philemon's success and being refreshed. That's how close we are called to be to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And again, if you want to get fancy, this word joy, I have joy from you. This is actually the same Greek word as useful. Remember we talked last week, we did the puns? This again is another pun by Paul. It might say joy, somebody else's translation might say something else, but if you want to circle useless, useful, useful, and joy in right lines to them, those are all the same word, useful. It's a pun on Onesimus' name, which means useful. And this is actually Paul writing his letter and making a call back. So as long as Paul's calling back, let's do it too. What kind of shorts do clouds wear, anybody? Thunderwear. Ah, it's a call back to last week. I know. And sure enough, last week I had a couple of guys walk up, take me aside and go, uh, can I get a copy of that thing? Because I want to pull those out for Christmas. We have Easter, we have Easter coming up, and I want to pull that out and just kind of drop some of those puns. Because it's a dad joke. But the point is, is that these are the same word in Greek. We just don't see it when we look at it in English. It's important. Also, too, this word heart again, this word heart is not the word heart. Does anybody remember what the word is? Bowels or guts. In Greek, this word is not heart. They have a word for heart. It's cardia. This is not that word. This is the word guts. This is, Paul is using a deeper, more guttural, more just like, just really hard, emotional word. And it's the word guts. And again, if you want to circle heart in verse, what is it, verse 7? And then there's the, the verse in verse 11. It says a part of myself. That part of myself is also the word guts. And then heart is guts, the same Greek word. Again, circle, outline them, whatever, same word. It's this very guttural, like, oh my gosh, at my, I, can, I, I hurt when you hurt, and I'm happy when you're happy. We are so close, you, you are like inside of my body, and I just feel you. That's why we translate it into the English heart, because that just makes more sense for an English reader. We don't generally go, oh my gosh, my, I can feel Bruce in my guts. That sounds weird. Yeah, see, I see all your friends there. You must smell nice today. <laughs> refresh, refresh. And also this word refresh says pour into me. Now here's a little bit of, a little bit of Greek I'm going to teach you guys. The word refresh is an imperative. An imperative, say imperative. imperative. An imperative is a command or a demand. It's going to come up again. An imperative is a, de a demand or a command. And Paul is telling Philemon to refresh me. Do this. Make me happy. Help me in my chains. I'm a prisoner right now. Hearing about your success will refresh me from the inside out. It'll help my, my insides and my whole being be refreshed. If you forgive Onesimus. And then here, this Greek word, yes. This word yes actually refers back to being a partner. He's saying, yes, you are partners so please do this because you're a partner in Christ. And the reason is, is because we need to take a healthy pride in the lives of others. We talked about this already. Every single one of us need to take a healthy pride in the lives of others. We need to, we need to really honestly identify with some of our brothers and sisters in Christ and be able to celebrate their, their achievements and mourn their losses. Here we have 2 Corinthians. Look at this. Paul says this. 
He says, for if I have made any boast to him, doesn't matter about you, I have not been embarrassed. But as I have spoken everything to you in truth, so our boasting, our bragging to Titus has also turned out to be the truth. And in his affection towards you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of all of you and how you have received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that the complete confidence with, that I have complete confidence in you. Paul is bragging about this other church. And he's, again, he's not there. He's not physically there. But he hears about them reaching the lost and loving each other. And he brags about them. He celebrates with them. He loves them so much that he identifies with them. It's amazing. We need that in our lives. I mean, every single one of us today could happily admit that we are not always on top of our game. We struggle with depression. We struggle with issues at times. That is when you need to rely on the lives of others. You've poured into a lot of people. If you're a Christian, you have. If you come to our church and you're a member, you serve. Through serving, you get to know people. And you get to help. Then you get to see their lives flourish because of your obedience to Christ. So example, my mom, for example, she supported me for my, through my doctorate. She encouraged me. She even paid for me to get a hotel room so I could just get away and hide from all you people. But here's the thing, if you asked my mom, if you asked my mom about my doctorate, you would think that she wrote the thing. Like she sat down and wrote my thesis or something. Like she was an intimate part and it could not have happened apart from my mom. But it's not because she's prideful or she thinks that she actually did this. She did nothing to write my paper. But she is so intimately involved in my life. She identifies with who I am and what I do. And then everything I do, every success that I have, she wants to tell people. I actually hear from other people about how my mom is bragging about what I've done. She's bragging about something somebody else has done. And that's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to have that as some scaffolding for your own life. When you are struggling, you can honestly make a phone call to somebody and go, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing awesome. Praise God, I'm so happy you're doing awesome because I'm not. And I needed that. I need to know that other people are successful even when I'm not. We need to love on one another. We need each other in our lives. That's how Paul survived prison, unlawfully prisoned. He was in prison for preaching the gospel, and he was still able to have a thankful attitude because he was living vicariously through the lives of his brothers and sisters on the outside. He was in prison writing letters and getting letters back and hearing about how the gospel was spreading, and even though he was locked up, he was rejoicing and praising Jesus on his knees in the corner of his cell. Oh, thank you, Lord, because he was living vicariously through the lives of others tell you right now, there's a lot of us in this room right now who could use some success in our lives. And you can, you can bank on the success of others if you pour into their lives as Christ has called us to. We need the church. Which leads to point number three. My church provides healthy pressure for me to grow in my faith. This is a subtle point. Again, you might miss it if, you're, if, you, don't, uh, if you don't read the New Testament and kind of read some of the less read verses. It says, but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I hope that through your prayers I'll be restored to you. This is a healthy reminder to Philemon that Paul is going to come and check up on how he's doing. You might not see this, but this is what he's doing. He's saying, hey, you can do this and do much more. Awesome. By the way, prepare a room for me because I'm going to come check on you. And it's good. It's important for us to have that. Growing in our faith is hard, and part of being a part of a church, again, the tree is not going to encourage you to grow in your faith. Being a part of a church, is, it helps you to bounce off of each other, sharpen each other. You need that healthy worry that somebody might hear what's going on, and then also be open to changing if somebody confronts you, because you never know where your pastor might be. <laughs> this is Lucas taking a selfie, and then I was just like, You never know. I have run into some of you, we're not going to name names, I have run into some of you in the liquor aisle at Hy-Vee. I've run into some of you at uh, just at the Hy-Vee in general, at grocery stores, at restaurants, at the casino. I've run into a lot of you guys all over the place, and it's kind of nice to know your pastor's out and about. Isn't it? Buying beer and 
Even at Shakespeare's. I went to Shakespeare's to visit you, make sure you're on the ball. <laughs> Watching you is a full-time job. But here's the thing. The, I, the, the IVP commentary agrees. It says, Paul visits people to test and empower them. And again, we see this in the word prepare. Okay, the word prepare is an imperative, which is a? Command. It's a command. Good job. An imperative. Go feel free to circle that word prepare and write command. Again, he's saying prepare. He's not asking Philemon. He's not saying, hey, would you? He says, prepare a place for me. I am coming. I will come to you. Also, too, in the Greek, you might miss it, this word your prayers. He says, hey, I hope that through your prayers I'll be restored to you. This is actually a plural, your prayers. He's actually saying at this point, not only is he coming to visit, the whole church is reading this letter, and they will also be watching to make sure you do the right thing. Your, plural, church's prayers. For example, I had this happen. This is good stuff. I had this happen. Here's some young ladies in my life. They're not my wife, as you can tell, if you know my wife. I was out with this one, and her and I, I was holding her hand. I had my arm around her. I took her to a movie, and some of my folks in, in, from my church in Wisconsin actually saw me. I didn't see them. But then the next week, my pastor calls me into the office after church, and he goes, hey, can I talk to you a second? I said, sure. And he says, hey, uh, just heard that you were out and about with a woman, a young, a young lady, pretty, not your wife. And I just want to make sure everything's okay. And I said, where was that? He goes, movies or whatever. I said, oh, yeah, that's my sister. <laughs> and, that's, and it was her birthday. I took her out for her birthday. But the thing was is that rather than being offended, like, who are you to talk to me like that? I love my pastor. I love him. I would do anything for my pastor because he was there for me through drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things. I trust him. And when he confronted me, I took no offense. I was actually happy that somebody who's not related to me was so worried about my marriage and my wife's relationship with me that he would take the time to confront me. That's what real love is. He took the time to say, you know what, if it would have not been my sister he would have corrected me immediately and then we would have had a conversation with my wife. Somebody's out there looking for my wife's best interest as well. Praise God. Now here's the thing. Paul says, hey, prepare a room for me. Really nice, right? Well, listen to what he says to the Corinthian church. Now some of you are inflated with pride as though I'm not coming to you, but I'm coming to you soon for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. The kingdom of God is a matter of power. He says, what do you want? Should I come to you with a rod? or in love and spirit of kindness. Let me translate that into American English. Do, God is not all about talk. God will bring down the hammer. Would you rather have me come with hugs and kisses or a wood spoon? Does that translate better? <laughs> the point is, is that Paul did this on a regular basis to try to make sure people understood they are being checked up on, and we need that if we're being honest. Number four, and here's the reason why, correction is for my benefit. Don't take offense. Correction is for my benefit, your benefit, our benefit. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, he has this big long list of people who are co-workers. We need to know that correction, I'll explain this why this makes sense in a minute. We need to know that correction is not being beaten. It's not being slapped. It's not being verbally abused or accosted. Correction is simple. It's just correcting your driving. Here's an example. Here's me praying desperately while my daughter is driving for the first time. <laughs> I, I was praying, crying a little bit. My life is in my daughter's hands, which is a scary situation. She's like 15. Amen? Do you guys want to drive around with a 15-year-old? I don't. But here's the thing. With my daughter... I don't yell at her or grab the steering wheel or, you know, whatever, slap her around while she's driving, but I do correct her. Okay, baby, stay off the curb a little bit, but I don't want to be by the other cars. Well, I don't want to be on the sidewalk. <laughs> you, it's correction, and it can be done in love. And she doesn't think I hate her or I'm angry at her. I just lovingly correct her because I want her to be safe. And correction is good. Proverbs tells us the one who follows instruction is on the path to life. But the one who rejects correction goes astray. This is my favorite, though. I love this translation. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but the one who hates correction is 
Stupid. I love that. Right to the point. Either you love correction or you're stupid. That's the Bible. Paraphrase. The Pastor Josh paraphrase. Correction should be gentle. It should come in gentleness. But more often than not, it has to do with the attitude of the person who's receiving the correction. And the reason why this, is ma this matters is because here, we see Demas here. He's in this list. Demas is a trusted co-worker for Christ in this letter. But we know from Paul's last letter to Timothy, he says this. He says, make every effort to come to me soon. I need you, Timothy. Please come to me. He says, why? Because Demas has deserted me. He's loved the world. This is a very nice way of saying that Demas has rejected the faith that he's come to believe. Titus, Jesus, or Paul says this to Titus. He says, for the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. Amen? But here's the thing. He says, instructing us to deny godlessness in worldly lusts and to live a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. By participating in the faith of other believers, we not only grow in our own faith, we safeguard our hearts and our minds from falling away. And let's be honest, we all need that encouragement. This is how we, re we remain obedient, as Paul has called us to be, by participating in the faith of the church which is God's people. You need the church. It's God's people. You need God's people in your life. First Peter, he says here, by obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Our obedience to the, love, the word of God purifies us. For what purpose? What purpose are you being purified? To love your brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter what color their skin is or where they came from or if they're in China or South Korea. The brothers and sisters in Christ need your love, respect, and grace. And we are here purifying ourselves first, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then you are encouraging others. You are being purified to be a blessing to God's people. That's how they will know us, Jesus said, by our love for one another. Paul says this in, earlier in this exact same letter we're reading of Philemon. I am confident of your obedience. This is why Paul ends with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He's meaning that he wants the grace of Jesus Christ to define you individually. He wants to move within you, be your life force. Having Christ with your spirit is a promise of a relationship that transcends time and space. It doesn't matter if you're in prison, it doesn't matter if your marriage is falling apart, it doesn't matter if you're in drugs or alcohol, whatever is going on in your life, your relationship to Jesus Christ, working with your spirit, convicting your heart through the church, transcends time and space if you only would allow yourself to be moved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace and mercy. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be obedient to your word. You don't ask for blind obedience. Far from it. You're asking us to obey with our eyes wide open. To apply your word to our lives. Your word is the owner's manual for mankind. And what better place to get advice than from the one who created us. Lord, you are so gracious and merciful. We thank you for the opportunities we have to serve you, to serve you through serving one another. You need nothing from us, but you are glorified when we serve each other and love each other. We pray, Lord, that especially at the River Community Church, that we would be known in this community as a church that loves one another and by extension loves this city. But it starts with each and every one of us individually. And I just ask if you guys are here praying with me right now, I just say, just for your own self, just think about what I'm saying and pray with me. Father, me, myself, help me get my own life together. 
Help me to honor you with my life. Help me to start with me. Help me to quit blaming others for all my mistakes. Help me to look at my own life and to open my own eyes to my own sin and help me to work on myself. And now that I've identified those sins, Lord, forgive me for those sins. Now that you've forgiven me for those sins, Lord, help me to find people in this church to come alongside of me to help me grow in my faith and to slowly but surely rid my life of all these things that are killing me from the inside. We just pray, Lord, that you would do a miracle in the lives of the folks that honor you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.